Betty Lanchester of the University of Southampton. The title is Some Remaining Mysteries in the Aurora. Well, good evening, everybody. Well, I chose the uh, title for my talk for a very good reason. Yes, there are definitely mysteries remaining in the Aurora, although I do have friends who sometimes say to me, Betty, surely you understand the Aurora by now. Uh, but, um, no, the reason that I chose this title is... Well, I'm hoping that it's going to... I have to click there. Yeah. Is this, that in 1975... James Dungey gave the Harold Jeffries lecture with this title. You're all going to read those <coughs> words there, but that's, I'll leave you to read that while I talk. I'm going to add a couple of words there, still more, and um, you might also note that this copy was uh, from a Henry Rishbeth copy, and uh, he, uh, yes, I had to climb up a ladder and a lot of dust was involved in finding this copy, but Henry was a, a long-standing colleague and friend for many years, and he would have been very pleased that I was giving this lecture, and in fact, I am very honoured to be giving this lecture. Now, the, uh, Jim, in his lecture, said these words. The visible omission, I won't read them all out, the visible omission of the aurora wasn't his mystery. He was only interested in things that had exceptional potential for comprehension and logical discussion. Now, I'm afraid... Some of the things that I'm going to do involve the ionosphere and particles that are moving in electromagnetic fields. And so my other title is this one. <laughs> and uh, I hope I'm going to convince you that, uh, that the, uh, there are still some mysteries, and even if they're a bit messy. Uh, and I have the two key things that, I, uh, that I'm going to talk about here. I hope that they're going to have some, maybe not exceptional potential for comprehension, but some potential for comprehension and discussion. The aurora does give us this visual look at what's going on on a magnetic field line. It does show us something that could be happening anywhere from the ionosphere right out into where it meets the uh, Earth's magnetic field, meets the solar wind. And also the auroral spectrum, and this is the messy bit, involves a lot to do with... It has a lot of information in it, but unless you know the physics and chemistry of where it is happening, then it could be misinterpreted. Now, in 1975, these, Jim showed these pictures, and they, at that time there was a lot of data coming in from rockets and satellites uh, and showing the extent of the, of the aurora and its dynamics. In fact, at about that time, I was really just getting going in the field very part-time, working for Pamela Rothwell in Southampton, and I was set to work to look at uh, Geiger counter data, which were flown on rockets with lovely names like petrels and skylarks, and they flew through the aurora from, north, from South Uist and Andoya, and I had to re-bin the data from the pitch angle spinning, and I was looking for a little peak in the, in the spectrum of energy coming from the pitch angle bin that was looking up the field line, because we were looking for something called a parallel electric field, parallel to the magnetic field, which for a long time was thought to be impossible to exist. Well, we now know that it does exist. It has been measured, but in, those, in this time here, we were still, mm, well, perhaps starting to find it. And that is actually the thing that I'm going to hook my talk onto, this parallel to be electric field that is necessary in order to get the aurora we see. Now, Jim was quite interested in this boundary, and I've actually, it's always better to talk about something you don't, that you haven't done before, so... Just before the talk, I started to look at an, at an event which a student in Southampton was giving a talk about and did this morning. So Jade was showing her, and I thought, oh, what's going on there? So I started to look at that. So I'm going to show you some results, very preliminary, from a boundary like this one. The boundary between that dark region, which was known as the polar cap, and the auroral oval. And that was in a, a region that Jim Dungey was also very interested in. Now... He, he, as you know, probably do know, he was, he's, he was very famous for developing this theory of reconnection of, of the magnetosphere. And this is his diagram in 1950, well before he published his famous paper in 1961. <coughs> and this um, is from his thesis, and it shows this flow of, of uh, field lines, and you count them one, two, three, four, five. So it is unnecessary for the field line to be pointing in this direction to have this reconnection here and reconnection here and this set up a flow this was a really early idea of it so 
First of all, some background about reconnection, which uh, at this time, in 1958, it was really a hot topic. A lot of people were publishing, as many of you will, probably, will for sure know. All we need to know for my talk is that this inflow and outflow, the force J cross B, forces the plasma from one magnetic domain to the other. And rather than a movie, this shows plasma coming from, uh, coming from one field line at time one, and then it's further in, and our, this is the reconnecting line, this is the neutral point, and then by here, it's moving out. So there's inflow and outflow. That's the main thing for, for now. You could spend a whole lecture on reconnection. By 1975, Jim's diagram, this was in his uh, Harold Jeffries lecture, had a shock, uh, the bow shock and the shocked plasma behind it. But he was showing this because he was interested in these field lines which are called open and these ones that are called closed. In the, I'm, I need to point, probably. So these are open and these here are closed. We, he was actually also very interested in this region here, and this is known as the plasma sheet or the neutral sheet, and he was interested in what happened at those boundaries, and so I'm, um, for that reason, I was looking for a boundary event. This is a, a, a figure from Hughes, which is well known, and it shows the open and closed field lines quite nicely. Here we have this southward magnetic field from, this solar, from out in the solar wind, the interplanetary field, IMF, and these green lines are the ones that are open, and number six has this reconnection here, and from here on, it's, it's actually a diagram in the, mag in the meridian plane, but these field, these field lines here are actually coming out of the plane and coming around the side, which is shown by this diagram. So we have our counting one, two, three, up to six, and then seven, eight, nine come back around again. So there's a flow, and this was the Dungey model, which he published in 1961. This diagram shows a little bit more about this region here that is of interest. So we have all of this region here can cause aurora. Or particles from in here can all come down and do something here and cause aurora. But this boundary here, this is where the main rec reconnection event happens. And this thing called plasma sheet boundary layer is, is where it is thought that a lot of activity happens and is of interest. But this is an area a lot of people study, which is not what I'm talking about today. Also in Jim's lecture, he talked about currents and how important they were to understand. And in 1975, it was just becoming uh, common for the, the satellites were passing over, just like in this diagram here, were passing over the poles and measuring these large-scale currents. So I've put a, pub, a picture from his thesis in, so I've got a couple from my thesis, because actually my PhD thesis was on MagSat data looking at magnetic field perturbations with all sky pictures from Svalbard. It is, I mean, this was a long time ago, and I've ended up with, with instruments in Svalbard at the end of my career, so it's very neat. But this was, a, this was data from MagSat, and this is a disturbance as the satellite fl fl flies through these east-west aligned sheets the east-west component goes, this is upward current. This slope means upward, downward, downward, upward, just like that. The, this is sort of showing the same thing, but with these convection lines. But the, thing, the most important thing to, to, to take from this picture for now is that we have electric fields, or in this case, field aligned currents down and up, but closing them is this Pedersen current. And the Pedersen is named after a, a physicist whose name is on it. We use it all the time in ionospheric physics. So I'm going to be using the word Pedersen conductance and Pedersen conductivity. And it is the, it is the uh, current that flows in the same direction as this perpendicular field that's caused by these magnetic fields being pulled back, a delta B causing currents. But it has to have the ionosphere for it to work. Uh, I, a, another gratuitous, oops, a gratuitous picture from my thesis is actually interesting because it shows that there was an arc. I found this, you notice all these drawings were done with ink. Actually, all those other Geiger counter things were done with graph paper, pencils, and rubber. This, a lot of ink in my thesis. And this, this um, arc was right on this boundary. And uh, it's, it's, I, I 
I think probably there's an awful lot of MagSat data which would be really good to go back to. It's not going to happen, I think. <laughs> so the, he, I've picked out some of the mysteries in, in James Dungy's lecture, which are still mysteries today and really the things that I'm looking at. So it was the, the current density along an arc um, is very variable. He noticed in those big pictures these huge spiralling things, large-scale sp scale spirals, and so therefore you can't, they can't be plain sheets of current. So they might be way out in somewhere in the magnetosphere, but by the time they get down to where you see the aurora, they must be very twisted, and therefore there's a lot of implications about what's going on in mapping out in that case. Then there's the open and closed boundaries, which I've mentioned as, as well. What's the source of that? Large-scale electric fields, of course, mean you've got a lot of current variability, so that is hugely important. And do thin arcs connect to a magnetic neutral line? Well, that was an idea um, originally posed by Fred Hoyle, and he was James Dungy's thesis supervisor, but it was an idea that was posed and carried on and actually bore enormous fruition. Now, I'm going to show you an example of this. So just the physics from the sort of top to bottom, what we need to understand. So out somewhere out at the boundary of the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere, there can be a lot of structures listed here. But the information from those structures have to be transported down to the ionosphere. And in doing that, we need to understand how that's carried through waves, through particles, through um, field-aligned currents. For instance, beams of particles will travel faster than the alphane waves, so that transport of information may get mismatched. So you may have some information from the same place ending up at different times and places in the ionosphere. So it's quite tricky. And assumptions have to be made. So the, the magnetic field stops being traceable <coughs> once we have the violation of frozen in. I should say, I shouldn't use this term without explaining, but I'm sure you probably know, plasma and magnetic fields are bound together in most of that our environment we study, but when we get reconnection, we have to, or when we get a parallel electric field, then this is this is violated, and therefore it's an event much more complicated to map. And then the other thing is that a lot of things must happen between those structures out at the boundary and down below. There can be other processes interrupting, and that's for sure they are. There, we've been having a meeting today and a lot of things are interrupting. We've noticed, we've had lots of good talks about uh, other events, other structures happening in the magnetosphere. And then the role of the ionosphere is actually probably one of the most important things because you won't have aurora without an ionosphere with, which is dragging the feet of those foot field lines and causing currents to flow. Conductivities change, so the currents change. The density changes, so the conductivity changes. It is incredibly complicated but we try, try to understand it. This is a bit out of date these days, but it still serves a purpose. We don't have TV tubes, but it shows, uh, it just points I make when I'm giving <coughs> public lectures that the average energy in the solar wind is only about one EV, so 10,000 times greater by the time it gets to, the, to, be, to make aurora. And so we, um, we need to understand those things that are going on in between, and that requires parallel electric fields. But as I just said, the feedback processes are really important in the ionosphere. Now, it's always best to use examples <laughs> of data when you were there, and so I'm going to give you two, and eventually you'll get to see some aurora quite soon. Um, so on this occasion, we had just installed um, an imaging spectrograph in Svalbard <coughs> in 2000, and the very first day that we sort of switched it on and went to look what was happening, there we were trying to measure protons. We were measuring hydrogen beta. There was a huge signal, and this is why the solar wind had a large proton number density suddenly increased from well, to a very high number, 40, and it carried on doing that beyond this graph. The velocity increased from its low level to 700 kilometers per second, which is high speed. And this is what we saw. Now, you're going to see a movie is going to run, uh, and it, it's three hours and six seconds, so it'll, I'll loop it. So I'll just warn you what you're going to see. So and this is to the sun. So remember that reconnection model, where first thing that happens is that a field line is reconnected 
on the nose of the magnetosphere. So you see a spot happen here, and then later, 20 minutes in real time, which is less than a second in this, uh, there'll be a, a substorm and a, another reconnection event at the night time. So here we go. There was the spot there, and there's that. It'll go again. See it the second time. Here we go. There, there. So that is the reconnection model of the magnetosphere. So, yeah, so that, as Anders said, Svalbard was, we got some lovely data that day. Lots of papers from this day, and the next day it carried on. Then in 2011, I was very lucky, I was lucky enough to be at the Chapman Conference on auroral processes, and the month before, the sun looked like this with a big coronal hole and some nice sunspots, and we hoped that a month later it would come round and be just as good or even better, which it was. So on the 1st of March, it was this coronal hole was pointing at Earth. It was very active sun. And so the first day of the conference, this was the 1st of March. This is what the solar wind looked like. We need southward turning southward BZ, which is this red line, very southward. Lots of excursions up and down, which means you get a lot of jolting of it. We have the density going up. We have the velocity going from its low value to high value. So we had a stream of really good aurora that every night it was. In fact, you can see this from the ground magnetometer. So whenever you see a disturbance in the magnetometer on the ground, there's already aurora above you. It's, it's saying you've got horizontal currents, but they're the closing ones from the field line currents. So this was absolutely all day on the 1st of March, and then every night we had more aurora. So it was a spectacular day, and just here we come with some pictures from that event, from that day, because they show quite nicely what's going on. Here you see, I hope, I hope it's dark enough, you can see some big waves moving westward, I've put up here a little, this is not the same, this is from the image satellite, which I didn't explain. That was the earlier one. I'm sorry, I dashed over that. This is the image satellite. And this is where the all-sky camera is, about that size as well. So those waves moving westward, and then I think we might find some... Can I do it again? Yeah. And you'll find big, large-scale things. This is, um, this is on the equatorward boundary. This is actually the region that Jim Dungey was most interested in, and especially these pulsations. So the polar cap, the dark region, is way up, way north here. Then the next slide, if I stop it, yep. Mm. Try this. Is now at midnight, and so you now see what's a substorm. They, were, they just were happening all the time, but this is a really bright, spectacular one. These long rays with lots of energy spread along the field line. Lots of um, the energy spectrum would be very s spread. And then eventually you see some more pulsating things up here. They're, they're about, um, the pulsations are about tens of seconds. This is so sped up 150 times. So that was around midnight. And then when you move to the, um, the, the further round, so you now see Alaska has moved beyond midnight round to this side. Now you see the structures are all moving to the east. Now this doesn't always happen. I mean, you've got, still got things down here. But it is fascinating that that convection pattern from the Dungey model has flow going westward um, around here and eastward there. And these huge structures are doing that too. But the convection is, is nothing like the velocities we see in the aurora. So how do you connect the visual aurora with the ionospheric flows, the large-scale flows, which are, which are nowhere near the same speeds, but there is a connection and the only way you can work this connection out is really to go to smaller scales because the electric fields close to the aurora are very large, much larger than the background ones. And they all sort of are adding up to this picture. So I'm now going to show you a little bit of data from an in our, inst our new, inst uh, reasonably new, 10 years old instrument, which is in Svalbard, which I'll talk about in a minute. But just here is a, a sample showing small-scale waves. We're now looking at a dot in that previous image. This is now three kilometres by three... Yeah, three degrees by three degrees. And you can see that there are some really small little waves moving through. They're only a kilometre in wavelength as opposed to 200 kilometres. And you also see this by this one. You see a little gadget go by, and then it ends with a sort of inverse one. There are structures within the aurora that are 
DARP, and uh, they are quite important to understand. So more about that in a minute. So just to, an idea of what we can, what we can aim to learn. Um, as I said already, the, uh, the spectrum contains all the information, but we need to do the physics and chemistry. And also, we have to be able to subtract. There's never just one emission in a filter. The dynamics is really is what we need to put into our models and simulations. So that's what I'll be focusing on with that. And the importance of the gaps, as I said, it's like rests in music. The gaps are just as important. So if you've got structuring, what's in the bits between the bright bits is really important, and it's important in the aurora. It's just, as I say, it feels to me a, a, an analogy, a very good analogy, that you know, I have to understand what's going on in the gaps. Actually, a lot of currents are in those gaps, probably. Oh, this slide was for my benefit, but it's OK. So I'm going to show you some, um, uh, this instrument that we just saw a little clip of and uh, some of the modelling which we use, we use with it, which is necessary, and this event which I just randomly decided to do for today, which is a boundary arc. And then, a, if I, and then a little bit about the simulations where we try to match together observations and uh, theory. So this is the instrument. And unfortunately, Nikolai Ivchenko has just left, but he was giving a talk today and he's had to go back to Stockholm. Uh, he was the designer and the, the person who really saw this instrument be built. And it was extremely exciting for me to be part of this and to actually the person who got the money for it and then to have the benefit of using this because it's a really powerful instrument. It's three cameras uh, with EMCCD and or um, cameras here. It's, and they, um, there's a, a, um, yeah, there's a, um, an F1 lens here which makes a six degree, but we can put these, these telescopes on and make it a three, the three degree field of view. But the whole idea is that you're measuring three different wavelengths at the same time. So there are three, three computers down in here. So this joint um, venture is run with KTH in Stockholm and Southampton. And here's some pictures of where it is. And so this is Svalbard in summer, Svalbard in winter. And this is uh, three, three of our group putting bits of it up there, I think, for the, for the next season. And it sits right beside the ice cap radar which I, I, in Svalbard, which I'll be showing a little bit of data from. It looks field aligned, as does the instrument. So we're looking up the magnetic field at this point. So why three... Um, emissions, well more of that in a minute, but these are the three emissions, and we measure um, a nitrogen emission, these bands here, and that is caused by high energy particles coming down low enough to, um, to cause excitation of the nitrogen. Well, I say that. It's, it's really important for me to say another thing about Aurora, but I'll do it the next slide. This is O+, uh, this, uh, this one. This is a long-lived metastable ion with a lifetime of five seconds. I'm not going to be using that data here. It's really the most exciting part of the instrument because if the long-lived nature means that we can use it to track electric fields, but I'm not talking about that today. There's a limit. And then this one is an oxygen atom emission, which is mostly uh, caused by low energies. So let's have a, look, a little look at the modelling, which is um, where it might... where I'll say what I, was going to be important. This lambda one is the nitrogen. So most of the volume emission happens down at 100 kilometres. And this is the long-lived one, up at 250. And this one is more sensitive to low energies. It does have some high <coughs> energy. It comes from dissociation of the oxygen molecule into atoms. But I want to say that the aurora, in fact, I think Jim Dungey said this in his lecture, people think that it's high energy particles coming in, ionising and exciting, or exciting. No, they come in and ionise but the excitation happens purely and utterly from the secondary electrons that are caused. So all of the light you see is caused by secondary electrons, pretty well all of it. So the main particles ionise, but the, the secondaries do all the light. Now, it's important to have this right as well. So we combine this and this, and we use a ratio between that one and that one to tell us the energy. And this is just a, a slide here to show how that works. So this is the, integrating the results of our model, our ionospheric model, 
which I didn't explain very well, so I'll just go back slightly. So we use different energies, input energies, and get out these volume emission rates for each of those energies, 20 keV down to 20 eV. And uh, the colours show the different results. So if we height integrate those, we get a relationship for the nitrogen, which is pretty well flat. We can use that through our modelling to work out what the energy flux is. And then the ratio between these two is varies by this much, by 30, well, more than 30, between 100 eV and 10 keV. So we can use that to give us the energy. So if we have a, um, a ratio, we measure a ratio of 0.5, then we can say we have an energy of about 1 keV. And it's pretty, well, very, pretty accurate. So this is the event that I looked at this diagram. I saw this on the screen and I thought, well, in a very short time, this satellite... Now, this is the, the follow-up to the DAPP satellite images I showed from Jim Dungey's lecture. This is DMSP, an instrument which scans... As it goes across, it makes scans of the, of the aurora in ultraviolet. And I could see that our instrument must have measured this boundary coming over. So I, that's, I thought, oh, let's have a look at that. So I did. And we have... There's a Finnish camera, which is an all-sky camera, and that's the one on the left. So this is, I'm afraid the moon is completely compromising it, but having decided to do this event, this is what we're having. So you can see that this arc moved from the southeast across. This is the boundary reaching us here. We're right in the middle. And then this is another camera. We have a 60-degree camera, and this is, the, this is our ask camera here. This is the size of the ask field of view, just about. It's and it's sitting, so this is the same thing coming, it comes and it sits close and then it enters our field of view. And so the next movie will be the ask cameras, all three of them overlaid in, in three colours. And here comes the boundary now, we're, we're looking field aligned. And the, the colours are a little bit confusing, but you might see the green hanging around. The pink means high energy, blue means low energy, the green is the afterglow of the long-lived oxygen ions. So there is a lot of information in there. You can see, actually, the energy ends up being really quite high there. But that's just pictures. We need to analyse it. We need to do really careful analysis and take uh, backgrounds. We have to uh, calibrate. There's a lot of uh, taking out emissions that might be not, not the ones we want to know. So... What we can do is uh, take... So this is just an idea of what we do. We can take the... Here are the two emissions, the blue and the, the black. They look pretty close the same. But this, the blue is the lower energy and the black is the higher energy. This is the energy flux and this is the energy. You can see, I'm going to... As I play it, it... Oh, it didn't. I have to press here. Yeah. The, the, the red line is taking us through. So this little box is being integrated... And so this is telling us how much energy flux and what is the energy in that little square there. And you can see here, energy flux and energy go up and down together. They broadly do here, but there's definitely a difference here. And there's definitely low energy at times. The low energy is relatively brighter at times. That probably means we've got some strong currents because currents are mostly made up of low energy particles. More of them at low energy causes current so that is, is an, a more analysis to be done. It's just an example that I'm using today. And we had the radar at the same place. So this was, is very clearly showing a boundary. In This is height profiles of electron density here. Nothing in, in the density there. The white means it's so low, the noise is high. So we have a boundary coming over us, and there's actually indication of low energy particles here, something... This could be a very interesting interval when the radar doesn't fit it. It might be something indicating currents, but haven't had time to do that. The electron temperature is really interesting because it's increased before the um, intensity has gone up, and that does mean that ohmic heating is going on. We've got currents heating uh, where there isn't precipitation. When you do get precipitation, then that also heats, but in a different, it's a different sort of heating. So... This transition is really important. So it's an example that I'm looking forward to getting into more. But, of course, 
when you start looking at something, I thought, oh, let's look at the, uh, let's look a little uh, around and about it. And I found two hours earlier, there was a, another boundary came over. So it was more like a substorm boundary. And again, we have this temperature increase. We have low energy particles. This time, last time the iron, temp the iron temperatures weren't very great, but here they are. And we've got, a, something happens here. You can almost, if you half shut your eyes, see there might be some upflows. But uh, so I thought, oh, let's look at that interval. And this is what it looked like. Now, um, you can see a big difference. This energy here is completely flat. It's just 6 keV, and we've still got filamentation and structure. So we now don't have the same thing going on. So we're, in, we're not at a boundary now, we're inside. So there is a difference. There are a lot of different things. We need different mechanisms to describe what's going on there. All of this structure, and there's almost there's some sort of pulsations going on as well needs to be, you know, it's not just one thing. There are many things going on. <coughs> right, so I do have one equation, and it's a generalised form of Ohm's law. And this is what we need if we're going to have, get back to our E parallel. So the only, there are, we can't get any E parallel from this term because it needs to be parallel to B, so this term is perpendicular to B. This term is... Um, Called the, it's the electron pressure term, as you see here, but I've put a sort of little dot through it because it's only going to be significant when the gradient... This is a normalised equation, so we've got a sort of scale length of L0 here. It's only going to be significant on this iron inertial scale, which is quite small. It will happen. It's not, it's not, it is going to be included. We need it. Uh, the, next, the other term is even smaller. That's on electron inertial scales and it's the plasma skin depth. So that's about 20 metres. So these things are not terribly important when we get down nearer the ionosphere, but they do have importance elsewhere in magnetic fields for sure. So the other, that leaves us with the resistive term. Now that is going to be important. And Jim Dungey mentioned this in his lecture, how if you have large drift velocities of the electron current carriers, then they are going to cause micro-instabilities which will act as a... To, to slow down those particles, act as a resistance, as a resistivity, and that turbulence is a sort of word for it. But that, we can... We know that that is one way of getting an electric field parallel to B. So it's more or less that the physics to get a parallel electric field requires really small scale lengths or very large drift velocities of the current carriers. So what are we are going to do about it? We try and simulate it. And the, this is work that I'm going to show that's done entirely by, although we collaborate with, Antonius Otto and his student, Tapas Bhattacharya, who, uh, for whom I have to thank for the, the next few figures. The, it's a, a simulation box which goes up about two and a half Earth radii, 20,000 kilometres, down to the ionosphere, and we in insert in that a resistive blob. We put in our, um, our resistivity in a region at about, uh, well, quite sure what the height is. At about, no, actually, yeah, one, a bit more than one Earth radii. Then uh, at the top, as I said, there's a shear. We have a shear in the magnetic field. That's introduced in the top part of the box. And as a result, alpha N waves will tra travel down uh, one, one for each perturbation with different polarizations. They will reflect in the ionosphere, and that depends entirely on the Pedis this Pedersen conductance. That is, that will determine the reflection. So whatever you set for, the, for this conductance will determine how they reflect. This is an important thing for what I'm going to say next, that the magnetic field, when it is... Uh, goes back from the ionosphere, adds, increases, that magnetic perturbation increases at reflection, but the velocity, the plasma velocity, is changes in sign, and so we have a reduction in the velocity as it's reflected back, and that is actually important to what happens to the physics. So, as a result of that, here are some, some results from that simulation. This is a cut through the box at the level of the blob, 
And you can see this is E parallel at the blob. It's increasing with time. These time steps are alpha in time, so they're a matter of seconds. And the uh, parallel field is getting structure in it and increasing in this region. But this is telling us what happens with time. And all through this time, so here's up until uh, it gets down to the, this is the, um, uh, oh no, this is when it passes the blob. So the waves pass the blob for the first time, they get a little kick. And then we're going on, and at here they're reflected in the ionosphere, and then they're coming back up. So all up until here is alphanic waves, by definition, where, where that's alphanic flow. But when it gets to here, this velocity, the velocity has reduced, and reconnection will only happen when the velocity is subalphanic, and so the re velocity having been reduced means that we now get reconnection here. And that means we get an increase, a very large increase in the current as a result of that. And just to show you that I'm not just making it up, this is a cut through now. At the, um, at the, at the same place, the magnetic field perturbations are sheared, but there's a, a, a decrease in this region here. If you think about that, um, the reconnection figure that I showed much earlier, we have velocities flowing in towards this region and then a jet out at both ends. This is, now, we're, we're, we're simulating reconnection as a result of those alpha waves and the B, delta B disturbance and having put in our resistive, resistive blob. This is the field line current, very strong, near the location of the reconnection. This is a little diagram to show what's happening to the field lines in this configuration. So the blue one at the top, at the start, went from that corner down to the bottom back one. It now goes around to here. And similarly, this one went from here to here. It now goes over there, over there. And so these are sort of swapped. And this is how you get currents and, and aurora stretched out in that direction in the ionosphere. So I could show lots and lots of results of these, of these simulations, but I'm just going to cut to the chase and show the sort of final best result that we have so far, although there's a lot more in between. This is now cut in the ionosphere. And what I showed up until now was just putting a blob of resistivity. What we really need to do and what's been done here is have the resistivity dependent on the current. So you would have a threshold where it starts to be important and it would actually move about. It won't be just stuck in that place. It'll go where the current has reached that threshold. And so you will have this resistivity very dynamic. And as a result, we get something looking like this in the parallel current. So this is a cut through at the ionosphere. So we have upward current, which means downward electrons, of course, and the red is in the opposite direction. So we have some up and down currents within this structure. On the right, and we've got flows. So these are the plasma flows beside these structures. Now, this doesn't mean aurora. This is just meaning current. So how do we turn it into aurora? Well, we integrate that parallel electric field. It's integrated in height. And this is what we get for the parallel electric field integrated. We get this as the precipitation energy. And I draw attention to what the size of it is. So it's corresponds to about 6 keV precipitation, which is what we saw in our events that I, I showed earlier. If we take a cut through that and look in a bit more detail through here, this region here, this is it, we find that the electric fields are 200 millivolts per metre. They are the sort of fields we're measuring with... Um, uh, IceCat radar with, um, and with our, um, in, well, in, in rockets we see that's, that's a very typical value of an electric field at the top of the, um, of the aurora. And here, instead of drawing the plasma flows, we've got the electric fields drawn in here. That's what this measurement is. They, that is the, the E minus V cross B electric field related to those plasma velocities. So it's a very realistic picture. And if I can just um, show you a, a comparison. This is just a frame from the movie of our boundary moving in. It, it almost, you can say, it's the same thing going on. We definitely have reconnection here. Now, 
remember that was a boundary right out, you know, was this, a, was this reconnection happening way out in the tail of the magnetosphere? No, this is happening much closer in. But the source of the particles must have started from that boundary. We are at the boundary of open and closed field lines. So it's what is going on all the way along there is really very interesting. So the summary of the simulation, which I say I haven't really done justice to, and I just want to add a couple of things here with these diagrams, is we definitely need a dynamic resistivity, and that produces a localised electric field. It it's, could be quite close to the top of the ionosphere. We could have magnetic reconnection is happening, but it could be very close. It's not, that, not necessarily right out at the tail of the magnetosphere or even at the magnetosphere boundary. So the local acceleration um, and current modification happens. That's the filamentation, which we see. And the alphanic perturbation into the ionosphere causes these potential structures, these thin potential... This is it here. This is the integrated potential structure. And we find these... And the narrow currents are embedded in a wider current region. We measure that as well. The theory of the simulation predicts that too. The fast flows, we measure too. But these are the two things that haven't yet had enough um, attention. If this is actually an example of putting in a variable um, Pedersen conductance at the ionospheric boundary, so there's a slab, a change, so it's one conductance to there, another to here, and, and so there is a, the middle's one thing and the sides are two different things. So you get an increase in... Probably I've got an arrow coming in. Yes, you get an increase in... Um, in where there's a gradient in the conductance, you get a very big increase in the precipitation energy and the field aligned currents. So that has not really been taken into account by many simulations. And the other thing is the density variations. If you've got a field aligned current, you've got where well, you've got electrons going up, the current has, I don't think I said this, which I should have, the Pedersen current is carried by ions. And so you can't have, you're not going to have, you've got, you've got um, a conservation of current, but the uh, and you're definitely going to get density is not um, it's going to have to build up here if you've got electrons going up and ions coming in you're going to get density increases and in the same place where you get currents going down, ions going away, you're going to get depletion so you get, and as you can see from the aurora we are definitely seeing that so if you change the density <coughs> you're changing the conductance so you're changing the currents so you're changing the density so this very complicated process is going on. So in summary, or in conclusion, this is the real-time boundary arriving. So I'd say we have clear evidence for magnetic reconnection at the footprint of this boundary of open and closed field lines. We don't know quite where it's happening. But the ionosphere is very key to understanding and getting any further because it... As I said, these conductivity and density changes, electron and ion heating, upwelling, they are all not really being taken into account in any of the simulations. And so the future really is to include a height-resolved ionosphere into those simulation boxes. And I would really like to be able to be doing that. So I uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed. So we have uh, five minutes uh, for questions or comments. Everything clear. Um, you mentioned MagSat. I was wondering if there's any scope for using the current swarm constellation of satellites yes, to I'm, investigate this. Yes, definitely. I am. I am actually working, we've got um, an ISI group looking at swarm data. With I almost was going to use that one, but it's, it's even less, you know, it's, it's more complicated, actually. But, uh, yeah, so the resolution is not as good as, well, it's different. It's really hard to, MagSat was fantastic, actually. It was really low, and it was quite high resolution. Swarm, it's more complicated for me to understand, but I'm looking forward to doing that, definitely. Yeah. No, I'm, no, I need I need to work on that next next job actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it'd be, it's interesting to, because the, the evolution of the constellation is, is under discussion, and it's whether we should bring them down yeah. during solar minimum or 
I mean, mm. it might be more interesting for you to have them lowering so at maximum, but obviously it will curtail the lifetime of the mission. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. No, no, I'm looking forward to looking at some of that. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Um, <coughs> I'm going to risk making a fool, fool of myself by asking a probably very silly question. Um, the standard model of the Aurora is... is externally driven. The energy input is from the, from the solar wind. Is there any possibility that there could be any role for input or driving from within, um, from the, the Earth's atmosphere? Um, I mean, I'm asking that question for one particular thing. That's the comparatively recently discovered sprites that go up mm. from the top of mm. thunderclouds at the moment of a conventional discharge. I mean, they're mm. rather auroral looking things themselves. Is there any possibility of that injecting energy into the ionosphere and into these processes? Well, I, I, it's got to start somewhere. I mean, I don't know. I don't, the sprites, that's, uh, yeah, that is different. Um, but it, no, it's not it's the same. I, I mean, some people would say that the aurora is generated by the ionosphere. I mean, definitely. It's, it's, um, but it's a feedback. It has to be. So something has to start it. So a disturbance in the magnetic field or something has to cause the ionosphere to do its thing. Yeah. You've got to, it's got to be hit yeah. by something. So seed energy. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's got, you've got to hit those atoms and molecules to cause them to be ionised and then excited. Yeah. So I don't think it can just happen. <laughs> I have to think about it. Yeah. I don't think it's a silly question. Peter has one. Um, I, had to hit a, I hadn't seen the simulations at the end, which I think are very impressive. Um, you need to invoke a resistivity. Yep. And this is, this is an old story in quantum physics, microinstability. What is the current thinking of Antonio Gotto and company about what the process is, what the microinstability is? Yeah, he, he, he doesn't actually, I mean, I, Antonio always says we're not actually working out what it is. We're working out what happens. But um, it, it, there are lots of candidates. I, I don't think we can know. Honestly, don't. I mean, there are other ways of getting a parallel electric field. You can get it from alphane, sheer alphane ways. They cause a different sort of aurora. But I think it is just, um, it's a resistivity that's caused by instabilities, caused by electrons drifting too fast, but, and something trying to stop them. I think it's, that, that, that's that, a hand wavy answer. I'm that sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think with uh, I think mm, it's it's very difficult. I think it's it, it's just one of the puzzles. So when you say on off, you're talking about the. <coughs> mm. Yeah. 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 I, I, well, I'm looking forward. Antonius is now retired and working on research. So hooray! You know, <laughs> looking forward to that. Maybe you can feel me. Okay, so I think you've satisfied everybody. So, Betty, thank you very much indeed for the damaging lecture. So that concludes uh, today's programme. Could I remind you?